let's talk about converting continuous time or analog signals into discrete time signals, a process known as sampling. The source of continuous time signals can be lots of things. For example, the most common would be outputs of some sensors. Examples would be temperature, microphone, electric guitar, or biometric sensors, optical sensors, and the list goes on and on. The device which converts a continuous time signals into a discrete time signals is called an A to D converter, which is analog to digital converter. The most important aspect of the A to D converter is its sampling rate, FS, which means how many samples of the continuous time signal is the A to D converter taking in one second. The output of the A to D converter will be a series of numbers, which we'll call the discrete time signal. In our discussions, we're using this notation here to represent continuous time signals, where the parameter is given in parentheses and T is usually time. And for discrete signals, we're using, or discrete time signals, we're using this notation here, where the parameter is given in square brackets and N denotes the sample number. And in general, the sample, sample number can also be negative. And more th theoretical discrete time signals, the sample number can go from minus infinity to plus infinity. Just as the parameter T for continuous time signals can go from minus infinity to plus infinity. Most commercially available A to D converters are organized as shown here. The first part is what is known as the sampler, where we go from continuous time signals to a sequence of numbers. Here, x of n, the values of x of n can be any real numbers. However, when you're representing numbers in a digital computer, you have, finite, you have to deal with finite resolution. That means you cannot represent all possible real numbers. You can only represent a certain set of quantized levels. So that is why the next step is usually the quantizer, where it converts these output real numbers into a set of predetermined quantized levels. In most commercially available A to D converters, both X of N and X Q of N, even though they are here, X of N is at discrete times. That means discrete, uh, you can, represent, you can represent x of n as uh, with integer parameters, both, and xq of n is also being represented with integer parameters, but the values here take real numbers. That means at this point, it's still an analog signal. Even though we are, we are representing it only at integer times, the value is still analog or continuous. Uh, output of quantizer, again, we are only looking at it at the, output of the quantizer at integer times or uh, at integer indices but the output here can only take a set number of values but it's still an analog signal and then comes the coder which takes that analog signals and converts it into a digital stream of bits for example you can think about X ascii code or representing each number with a 16 bit uh, bit uh, you know two byte uh, values or four byte values or converting it into double numbers the, that what you do here depends on what sort of coder you're picking so but the output of the coder is the digital information until then it's all analog but over here it's analog but continuous time over here it's analog but discrete time over here it's analog and quantized and discrete time over here it's digital and discrete time both the quantizer and the coder are very context specific and depends on what it is, what the task at hand. So for our discussions, we are mostly mostly concerned from in uh, mostly concerned with going from x of t to x of n. So for us, this going from this this particular block is the sampling process.
The relationship between these two signals was the zero sample was obtained at time zero. The first sample was obtained at time t, second sample was obtained at time 2t and so on. So in general, the, uh, the pattern here is x of n, that is the nth sample, will be the value of the continuous signal at time n times t. Now a better notation for t is t underscore s, denoting the sampling time or the sampling period. Uh, and in that case, we will have x of n is x of n times ts. Let's look at an example. So I have a continuous signal x of t is cosine 50 pi t. So if my sampling rate or sampling period is 1 over 100 seconds, that means my sampling rate fs is 100 samples per second. In this case, what will be my discrete time signal? So based on our discussion above, so x of n should be uh, the continuous signal x of nts. So if I substitute uh, t for nts, I get 50 pi n over 100, which will result in cosine 2 pi times 1 fourth n. So in this case, my discrete frequency is 1 fourth. So let's talk about sampling sinusoidal signals in general. Let's take a sinusoidal signal where x of t is cosine 2 pi capital F t plus phi. Note that I'm using capital F to denote continuous frequencies. Let's say the sampling rate is capital Fs and the sampling period is Ts, which will be 1 over Fs. And again, as per our discussion above, x of n should be x of n times Ts or x of n over Fs. So I'll substitute n over Fs for t. I will get cosine 2 pi capital F or Fs n plus phi. Right? So in this case, let's say the continuous frequency was capital F, then my discrete frequency is capital F or Fs. So this is basically the relationship between how do you go from a continuous frequency uh, in your sample it, what would be the discrete frequency. Let's look at some more examples. This time I have two signals. X1 of t is a continuous time cosine with a continuous frequency 50. And X2 of t is a continuous time cosine with a frequency 125. And note that th these are in continuous, so the units for these frequencies are in hertz. And let's say the sampling rate is 75 samples per second. We want to know what will be the discrete time uh, signals when we sample these continuous time signals with this sampling rate. So as we just said, if the continuous time frequency is capital F and the discrete then the, and the sampling rate is Fs, the discrete time frequency would be capital F or Fs. And this is true for, uh, for cosine, you know, we showed this for cosine signals. So Okay, so in these examples then, then if my x1 of t, the continuous frequency was 50, then the discrete time signal will, where, will be uh, this here, where the discrete frequency is 50 over 75, which will come out to be 2 over 3rd, or 2 thirds. Now for the second signal, the continuous time frequency is 125. So the discrete signal would be, the discrete frequency would be 125 or 75, which comes out to be 5 thirds. In the video on sinusoidal signals, when we were dis discussing discrete time sinusoidals, we said that uh, property number two was uh, when two cosine signals or two discrete time cosine signals have a frequencies which differ by integers, then they are the same signals. If you note the discrete frequencies of these two signals here, we see that 5 third is 2 third plus 1. That means x1 of n should be equal to x2 of n. This means we started from two different continuous time sinusoidal signals. Note that a, a continuous time cosine with 50 hertz is not the same signal as a cosine with 125 hertz. But if you sample these two with a sampling rate of 75 hertz or 75 samples per second, in the discrete time, you will get the exact same signal. So what is happening here is for continuous time sinusoids, let's say of this form, when f1 is not equal to f2, then the signals are actually different signals. For any time when the frequencies are not equal, you get different signals. But for discrete time sinusoids uh, of this form, whenever they have two signals where the discrete frequencies differ by an integer, you get the same signals. So in a general case, let's say we have uh, one sinusoidal signal with frequency f1 
and another signal with frequency f1 plus some integer times fs, where fs is the sampling rate. Then in the, in the discrete time, for x1, you get a discrete frequency of f1 over fs. For x2, you get a discrete frequency of f1 over fs plus m, where m is an integer. Therefore, this sinusoidal signal or the discrete time signal will be equal to uh, a freak, you know, another signal with frequency just f1 over fs. So this is the general case when, you know, when the continuous signal frequencies differ exactly by an integer multiple of your sampling rate in the discrete domain, you will get the same signals. This plot will help us visualize what's going on here. So in this curve, we have the blue curve is a signal with f1 equal to 10 hertz. The sampling rate is 130. And the red curve is another signal with frequency 140 hertz. Note that f2 is f1 plus fs. As you can see here, the two curves always intersect at the point of sampling. So even though in continuous time, the two signals look very different, if you, rest, if you just restrict to the samples, they look exactly the same because exactly at the time you're taking the sample, the values of these two signals coincide. This brings us to the question, when can you reconstruct the continuous time signals from their samples? So obviously, when things like this happen, where there are two different signals in the continuous time sig uh, domain, which are giving rise to the same discrete time domain, you don't know, you cannot figure out whether the continuous time uh, signal was this or this. So that means when you're sampling, there has to be some restrictions on the continuous time signal when which uh, under which conditions you can get back the original signal. Okay, so that brings us to sampling theorem. And the sampling theorem will be the topic of our next video.